Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game from round nine, the final round of the 2018 Sinkfield Cup. On the white end, Magnus Carlsen, and he's paired against Hikaru Nakamura. This is a lengthy game, a 97 mover, and as one might expect, there are many variations that come from such a game. The more I stared at this one when preparing for this video, the more I found. Uh, there's an interesting middle game tactic, uh, also, pretty cool stalemate resource uh, in the endgame. The usual case for stalemates. Anyhow, opening-wise, what do we have? It is a queen's gambit declined. With move 5, bishop f4. Light square bishops are quick to watch from the sidelines. Black capturing on c4 only after white has exhausted a move with the bishop. Bishop a6 is a move not to play if the black king is still on his home square. There's a common trick with a capture and then queen a4 picking off the knight on a6. Not the case here, but rather a simple exchange. And this is maybe the first moment that caught my attention. Black's move 11, recapturing with a pawn, not a piece. Why is black voluntarily breaking the queenside structure? Well, I believe this is related to the black queen's mobility. Black is anticipating that the queen will be under fire with the rook. The bishop is taking away squares. Well, by taking with the pawn, there are now two new options for the queen, two reliable homes. Getting some more development in. Rooks contributing, white knight improving. Knights are exchanged. White shores up the queen side with b3. Also, you know, having control over c4 means black won't be able to get rid of this weak link so easily. Each side has a flight square in. The knight on a4 is a strong piece. c5 is a focal point. This post is challenged with these next couple moves. Knights are now exchanged. White focuses on the only open file. This is a strong post for the bishop. Nice long diagonal. Secure square. Queen is challenged. And maybe this is the first decision point in the game. One of the key decision points to exchange queens or not. Black is also eyeing up a2. What to do? White says, let's keep the queens on. I'm going to keep the queen in the center. I'm going to take away your flight square. And I might have some tricks up my sleeve related to the back rank. So, in the game we have e5. What kind of trick would white have if queen takes a2? It's not some winning continuation, but I just want to give you a taste of how white can follow up from this position. Weird variation. Kicking off with bishop e5. The bishop is poison. Bishop on f6 has an important role. Defend the back rank. Bishop takes bishop. Leads to mate. Rook d8. Rook b4, queen f3. This is the variation that the computer says is a zero, even though white has only a pawn for the minor piece. The rook on c8 is vulnerable. The bishop's vulnerable. Black king is vulnerable to checks. There's a pin, and the black queen is way out here in left field. Computer says play rook at f8. Everything's cool. Okay. Anyhow, don't have that variation. Pretty wild interesting imbalance. In this game, it's pawn to e5. Carlson on move. Pop quiz. What does white play next? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, you ready for this one? Bishop takes h6. Who spotted that? If you're pulling off that move, you really need to see deep. It took about seven minutes to pull that move off. Nakamura's reply takes 20. Does not take the bishop. Rook e8 instead. What's the issue? With pawn takes bishop. One more pop quiz. What would white play next? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, well, it's a checkmate in 8. That's how poison that bishop is. Rook takes f7 would follow. An additional sacrifice. This is a cool line. Mate thread on h7. King takes rook is met with queen h7, rook d7, and these pieces are just animals. 
two majors on the seventh rank in direct connection with one another. Tough to parry the mate threat here. There is no parrying it. Mate in five. How bad is it? Computer says play queen c4. That's how bad. Okay. Neat sequence. Chop and chop. Black sees this idea. Rook e8. Some repositioning. a2 is only picked off now. e4 is when I start to think a bit more about good and bad bishops. Static structure. Bishop is not going to see along this diagonal. If white doesn't play e4, black may play e4. Open up the bishop's eyes, open up the rook's eyes to the e5 square. You can see either piece maybe want to pivot there. Queen takes b3, black is up a pawn. After bishop e3, what kind of compensation does white have? Well, very good pieces. I believe all white pieces are better than their black counterparts in this position. White is focusing on the queen side at this stage. The king side, this bishop, though passive, is a very good defender for the king side. So rook b7, rook d6. That is a threat. There is a pin. Bishop e7, rook d5. One of these two will fall. White hangs on to the e, or black hangs on to the e pawn. Bishops are exchanged, and we enter a major piece specific ending. Queens stick around for a little bit. One rook is off. And this is where we have some kind of fancy queen dance. Not the most exciting point in this game. King h2, and the rook is going to arrive on a6. It's important to make sure this pawn doesn't get rolling. You don't want to increase this rook's mobility. Rook on a6, try to maintain that post. It has a wonderful influence on the rook's mobility and raking that 6th rank in many key squares in black's camp. So, this is where we have a little dance with the queens. Not much going on. Eventually, they will be exchanged. So let's get to that point. And we will then be working with a much more technical phase of the game. The kings can now feel a bit more comfortable contributing in this position. No fear of some perpetual check. White remains better in this position, even though it's a balanced uh, position, balanced materially. Why is white better? Short answer, more active rook. And this is a case of an active versus passive rook. Really doesn't get much better than this post. Keeps pressure on a couple black pawns. Black has to constantly defend. Some play on the king's side, and we're soon going to have a critical moment at this point right here. King g3. Move 62 for black. Big moment in the game. What is played? g5. Why is this such an important moment in the game? Well, after g5, white plays h5, and this is a great positive. Nakamura, of course, understands this. He knows that connected pass pawns are very good. Why is he allowing that in this position? I'm, of course, speculating. An issue here, I believe, black is... I think Black was considering uh, playing g5 because he does not want the white king to get active by way of g4 and f5. So what am I talking about exactly? Well, suppose Black just sits, doesn't, doesn't budge with this pawn, just plays rook c7. This is how white could get active. g5, that pawn is pinned. If king g6, king g4, h5 takes king f5 this pawn will fall this pawn will fall soon the black king will fall in short i believe black does not want to see the white king get activated in this way however black can allow this g5 move but would have needed to see this sneaky stalemate resource so what is this stalemate resource well Black can sit and wait with rook c5 and not fear the g5 move because black would be able to play king h5, not g6, 
but rather king h5, stopping the king from advancing and allowing this pawn to be captured. So what's the trick here? What kind of trick would Nakamura have up his sleeve? After the capture on f6, black wouldn't recapture on f6. This is tough to spot, <laughs> to be sure. Black would have the move rook f7. What's the idea? Well, suppose the pawn just continues chopping. Rook takes g7 check, king h3, and black would have the move rook g3. If the king backs up, the rook just picks up a pawn, goes on to be just a draw. And if king takes rook, stalemate. <laughs> Pawns can't move. And yeah, no legal moves for the black king. Black would have to have spotted that stalemate resource, this, this sequence right here, uh, kicking off with g5. He would have had to have seen he could play king to h5 and meet pawn takes pawn with rook f7. Tough spot. Okay, well in the game, black says, I don't want your king getting activated like this. I'm going to allow you to have this connected past pawn. The king side is officially shut down. There's no path for the king on, you know, on this wing. He has to kind of go for a counterclockwise walk. <laughs> so this is what we have. King is heading towards the queen side. And black with this move a5. Not exactly sure why a5 is played. Uh, maybe black just doesn't want to bother with defending, defending, defending. He's just going to free up the rook, not worry about giving up a pawn. And maybe even another train of thought is, you know what, just go ahead and take this pawn. I feel that I could defend this endgame. And now that that pawn isn't around, maybe the likelihood of some stalemate resource later on is that much more likely. You know, I won't have that pawn around. That could make a, a legal move. Okay, black tries his hand with just giving up the a-pawn in short. Focuses on cutting off the king, and how to free the king. Well, first Carlson inserts a check, king g8, and now returns. The rook is needed in order for the white king to contribute. So the rook is helping out with this. It's helping pave the way for the king to hang a left. The white king is getting very active at this stage. And there's not much you could really do about the king getting into the black position. Slow, steady progress. Notice the strong post with the rook. Defending f3. Securing against file checks. What to do from here? Let's see. Rook b6 b7 check, and now the king is going to slowly try to work around like that. Rook b1, rook b3, so if black, instead of going for this maneuver, tried to hunt the pawn, there is rook c3 to defend. So that's why we have rook b1 to b3, there is no defense. With rook c3, king d7, rook takes pawn, king e6, material is balanced, however... White is better because of the peace positions. The rook is fantastic on the 7th, cutting off the king. And yeah, this is a super active king. There's also a passed pawn. Black does not have a passed pawn. So from here, rook f4. White releases this connected passed pawn on this move 92. h6 on board. King h8. And this was an instructive moment for me. I was thinking, well, I understood at this point playing king f7 would not be a good move because the rook isn't eyeing up the h7 square. The king could step up, and this is tending towards a draw. Pawn is soon going to fall. So you can't mask the rook. So what I thought is, well, let's maybe try rook g6 and then king f7 into g6. But the timing is just not right for that idea. So, for example, if white plays rook g7 in this position, black can take on e4, 
And if the king tries to sneak around like this, get to g6, and then try for this, it's just one tempo short. You're not able to give checkmate. That's one way to view it. This is probably a simpler way. By playing to g7 in this position right now, it's a demotion of the rook. Still staying on the same rank, but the rook wants to stay a bit away from the king. White wants to threaten mate as soon as the king steps on g6. White wants to be in a position with the rook to get to this back rank. It's on g7, you're not threatening mate. So, what does white do here? White makes a waiting move, rook b7. So now, what to do? If the rook captures, let's just pick one to go with. If, let's say, rook takes pawn, the black king takes here and is going to pick off this guy next. If rook takes pawn here, it's going to be mate. King g6, the rook is already in position to give mate. What to do? In the game, it's king g8. Now it's different. Only at this point does white play rook g7. Now it's hitting with check. That tempo matters. This one key check matters. King h8. And only now does the white king slip in to g6. There is no time to take the g4 pawn. Taking g4 in this position, well, there's multiple mates. You could play rook e7 to e8. That's clean enough. Or even in this position, there would be h7 and rook g8. You can't take on g4. In the game, rook a4 is played. And one final move, rook h7, that's the ball game. Nakamura resigns. Precise right to the very end. I like in this, this check. Why? Well, you're forcing the king, if the game did continue, to a square where now it's vulnerable to h7 with check. What would be the follow-up if this game continued? Again, after the check, Nakamura just threw in the towel. If it did play out after king g8, the rook plays to not just any square, e7. The queen side is insignificant. The idea here is to stay behind the e-pawn. It is passed, and after you take this pawn, uh, everything is going to fall. Black would have to defend with rook a8. King takes f6. g5 falls. The e-pawn falls. And soon the black king will fall. White's going to have two connected passed pawns. Black saw this one coming and simply threw in the towel. A marathon game. A 97 mover. In a very instructive endgame here. Very Capablanca-like. I don't think it was that long ago that I've Covered some Capablanca games with the Rook, cutting off the King. Very instructive endgame in this uh, final round game of the Singfield Cup. So if you're curious, tail the tape on this one. Inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders for each side. And uh, yeah, this was maybe one key moment. G5. Not uh, calculating that little stalemate resource. It was okay to allow white to play g5. But uh, yeah, it was just a growing advantage from there. King heads towards the queen side and then up and then over. Eventually getting into that g6 square. And in the end, breaking the black king. Average centi pawn loss of 10 for Carlson, 16 for Nakamura. The final results for the Sinkfield tournament ended up with three co-winners, Levon Aronian, Fabiano Caruana, and Magnus Carlsen. An interesting event, interesting game, a lengthy one again. As usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video, this game, in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.